Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Okay, so obviously we can see here that Jesus spoke a mystery. And a natural-minded person wanted to translate the mystery uh, and make sense of it naturally. And he fell. Amen? And that's why sometimes when we speak spiritually and people trying to like make sense of it naturally or relate you know, uh, to what is being said that is a spiritual thing, relate to it with carnal natural thing, they fall flat. The Bible says that, I'm going to read. Let me just carry on reading. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Amen. Hallelujah. So anytime we're speaking mystery, when Jesus speaks mystery to a carnal person, he's calling you to come up. Amen. You're, you're just being called. You're being invited, you know, to come up. Come up to this place. I mean, you're already used to this food, natural food and natural milk and all these natural things. But can you come up? There's another realm that is unknown to you. There's another realm that is uh, that you're blinded. You're, you're ignorant of that realm. Can you come up? He's inviting you to come up. Amen. Anytime Jesus spoke in parables, he wasn't pushing the people away. He was inviting them to come up. It's an invitation to come closer. It's an invitation to get closer so you can have a better vision, better eyesight, better you can see better when, you, when you're closer. Amen. So it's an invitation. Some of the things when they're too spiritual for you, don't get put off. Don't be upset. It's an invitation for you to keep on taking steps forward. Amen. Keep going. Keep coming closer. It will get to a, a, a stage where you see clearly. The Bible says that even right now, as we are human beings, as we are, we see dimly. We don't see clearly. We see as though looking through the glass. Amen. So Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He took it further. Well, unless you're born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water is for cleansing. Spirit is rebirth. Amen. Hallelujah. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Hallelujah. And then he now spoke about the wind. So Jesus now went on to speak about the wind. He said, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Right? He said, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. But cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone. So he likened the wind. He spoke about the mysterious uh, 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 wind or the wind, the mystery of the wind. And then he likened the wind to someone who is born again. He says, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. He's like that. Like the wind. You don't know the source of the wind. And you don't know where it's going. But you do hear the sound of it. Now, the world hears that people are getting born again. They're giving their heart to the Lord. They're hearing that. Footballers, millionaires, billionaires are giving their heart to the Lord. They're surrendering to God. Kanye West. I serve God. I serve the church. I serve Christ. Jesus is king. Period. I'm not going to make you guys dance in nightclubs anymore. I'll make the church proud. Amen. I'll make God proud. Hallelujah. But where did that come from? Kanye West. Where did it come from? It's mysterious. Amen. Nobody saw it coming. It's a work in progress. God was working internally, working on his heart. When he lost his mind naturally, he did not lose his mind spiritually. Amen. He was still able to cry to God just like the madman of Gadara. Amen. He was still able to cry and ask, Jesus' son. Born again. Where did he come from? 
how how do you get born again how do you become saved how do you become a christian and where are you going with it it remains a mystery to the unbeliever where are you going with that this christianity thing you are now a follower of christ you're going somewhere where exactly are you going with it nonetheless you have a source and you have a destination amen Though people don't know, people don't understand, people don't know where it comes from and where you're going, you do have a source and you do have a destination. Amen. They just hear the sound of it. But let me just move on. As we started, we start looking at the seven characteristics of the wind so that you can learn about yourself. Amen. As a believer, these are the characteristics that will be found in your life. And these are the things that the Holy Spirit will help you. Uh, uh, the qualities that the Holy Spirit will bring out of you. The first quality that I spoke about is the quality of flexibility. Amen. And when you look at the wind, the wind is flexible. Amen. So we covered that already. The wind is very flexible. You can bend the wind, but you cannot break it. So you can bend the believer, but you can't break the believer. Hallelujah. I gave you scriptures, many scriptures about this already. So we moved on, and then we covered the second characteristic, which was what? Gentleness. The wind, the same wind that is very flexible, which is you, the believer. You can go through, you can experience so much hardship, and still you are praising God. You know how to abound and still be humble. Amen. You're not only humble when you're, not, when you're broke. Some, of, some people are only humble when they're broke. Some people will talk to you with, in, you know, with respect when they are broke. When you used to walk, you didn't have a car, you spoke to me respectfully. You considered what I had to say. Now that you just got a car the other day, that's it. When I call you, you call me back two days later. Because you, you don't, you, you know, you're fine now. You're all right. When I speak, well, you know, you think about it and come back to me. But you see, as a believer, you don't only, you don't wait to make it or to have a lot to abound in wealth and riches or whatever it may be to be humble. You're flexible. Amen. Your humility is is. It's very flexible. You are humble with nothing and you're humble with much. You're humble when you know a lot and you're humble when you don't know much. Amen. In conversation, when it's a topic that you know better, you know more than the other person, you're still humble with it. The same way when you don't know much, you're humble with it. Amen. Hallelujah. Some people, when it gets to their topic, what they like, when it gets to that, you see their humility will vanish. And they start telling you to shut up. Be quiet. You're not a scientist. I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, you know, with, with the faith that we have been worn into, it's beautiful in the sense that we can be adaptable like that. Amen. We can adapt to different conditions. Amen. The fact that it's so cold doesn't mean you should be mean and upset. At everyone, you walk on the road, there are people, you no know, smiling. It's so cold. You don't wait for uh, summer to smile. Amen? It's okay to smile in winter. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. So, and then the second one is gentleness. Gentleness is something that you can only bring forth. You can only birth out of the spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that allows you to do that. I don't care who you are. If you're not a believer, your gentleness is not what I'm talking about. That gentleness is not what, you know, is referred to in the Bible. There is a gentleness that comes from the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's not quietness. It's not somebody who is quiet, somebody who is laid back, somebody who is reserved. That doesn't mean you're gentle. Because these people who are quiet, reserved, when you catch them in their bedroom, you catch them in their mind, they insult you. In their mind, they insult you. In their heart, they hate you violently. But they don't say it. That's all. When you ask them, what do you think? Nah, okay. <laughs> Are you happy? They don't say much, but they're saying a lot. Don't be fooled. That doesn't mean they're gentle. Don't put someone in position because you think that they don't talk much. 
They're very, you know, soft-spoken. You can be soft-spoken, but very, very... <laughs> not loud, but yeah, I understand. <laughs> Amen. All right, so gentleness. And then we moved on from gentleness. What did we cover? Did I give you another one? Violent anger. I gave you all kinds of... I gave you loads of scriptures, so I'm not going to go over those things anymore because I'm moving forward. Amen. Violent anger. There's also a quality that comes from the Holy Spirit. Anger. Violent. You didn't hear this before. I'm not saying all of you, some of you. Amen. That you can be angry in the spirit. You can be angry as a believer. It's okay. Hallelujah. Open to the book of Psalm 4 4. What does it say? It says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Amen. So be angry but do not sin. This is not the anger that leads to sin. Hallelujah. This is not the anger, the kind of anger that comes from self, selfishness, that comes from pride, that comes from a hurt. Hallelujah. Be angry, but do not sin. The Bible promotes a holy anger, which we all need. And I said to you last week, if parents don't have this anger, they won't be able to help their children or they will not raise you well. Amen. When your, your father or your mother is angry, your parent is angry at you, angry with you, it does not necessarily mean that they hate you. Amen. It doesn't come from a place where they want to hurt you. It doesn't come from a place where they don't want to talk to you anymore. Hallelujah. It's a different kind of anger. I'm talking about the righteous anger that Jesus himself had. Hallelujah. And I gave you those scriptures. So I'm going to move on and share a few more on violent, being violent as a quality that the wind has that you should also have. Amen. The wind can be very gentle. And the wind can be very violent. Have you experienced the wind that way before? Have you experienced the gentle wind before? And have you experienced the violent wind before? The same way, my face here that you see, I'm sure you experience very gentle face sometimes. Yeah, but there are other times when you will not experience the same face. And people don't like that. People want you to keep the same facial expression throughout. That's very bad. Even God does not do that. Amen. They want you to keep the same facial expression even when you're not happy with them. You should keep the same because I'm a pastor. How about you? When you're angry, I can smell it. Sometimes you look through the congregation and you can see those who are happy and those who are not happy. Especially with what you're saying. Not with what they're going through. With what you are saying. You can tell. And then towards the end of the service, some of them, they relax. <laughs> Remember that some people can only be won over by violent faith. As some situations can only change when confronted with violent faith. Amen. So your prayer, yes, it's fine that you pray under your breath. But that should not be your consistent way of praying. Because it reflects how you feel on the inside. When you're excited, you express it. Amen. When, you es when, you're, when, you're, when you're feeling excited, you express it. So how do you feel on the inside? You can't feel this anger against the enemy, towards the enemy for what he's been doing to your family, to yourself, taking advantage of you, abusing your home. And then when you were to pray, 
is still the same tone as when you were uh, just happy the other day and very, you know, calm. Nothing was actually happening. When you are at war, the way you present yourself, the way you fight is different. Amen. When you are aware that you are at war, it's different. The way you carry yourself. So the same way in your prayer life, I'm telling you this. When you read the Bible, Jesus prayed all kinds of prayers. Amen. Jesus set people free under demonic possession in different ways. He did not only say, go, your faith has made you whole. Sometimes he said, talim takum. Other time he cried and spoke against the spirit. Hallelujah. And there's a part in the Bible where he prayed to the point where he was sweating. Sweating what blood. Why is it that you don't sweat when you pray? You as a believer. And I'm not promoting myself, my own way of doing things. I'm, I'm telling you about the Bible. Is Jesus your model? Is Jesus the one you follow? Then I promise you, you'll go through these things. And you should learn from him. If he's passionate at times, and when his passion takes over, and he's, um, uh, uh, he's um, uh, what am I looking for? Compassion takes over his being. He expressed it outwardly. He cried. But you, you resist that tears because you're not used to crying. Jesus, God in the flesh, he did not resist it. To you, you look weak in front of people. Or you, tears don't come out. You just don't have tears inside of you. You're a very mysterious man. More mysterious than Jesus. So sometimes it's okay to express your emotion. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Amen. Express it. It's okay. Because it tells us a lot about you. And it puts us, it, it, it makes us feel, it, it, we feel safe around you. Amen. It puts us at ease around somebody that you know. Listen, whatever they do, you know, you, they will express it. Amen. And if you're not that way, it's not a curse. Hallelujah. You can grow. You can learn. Amen. Become a clay in the potter's hand. Become that, a clay in the potter's hand. Let him do whatever. Amen. When I was in the world, I, you know, and my background, men don't cry. I grew learning that my son was telling me, and my daughter, I was, <laughs> see my daughter was saying the other day that men don't cry. Because I said it to my son. You know, like I was talking to my son. My son was like, you know, I said, hey, hey, stop that. Because where I come from, men don't cry. Do you understand, son? But <laughs> well, is it true? <laughs> it's not a good way to be raised. Some, some of our parents, you know, from, you know, those days and time. They will never tell you I love you. They won't tell you that. Yeah. We waited to hear it from our parents all our lives and we didn't hear it. And I'm not saying all of us. Some of you, you're blessed to have that. You know, so I'm saying that, you know, just loosen up. Amen. Amen. Just loosen up in the hand of God. Amen. Don't still be yourself. Like you're always into yourself. Aware of yourself. It's sinful. Always. You're always into yourself too much. Relax. It's okay. Amen. And that's a sign of somebody who trusts God. More than you trust yourself. Hallelujah. The book of Numbers chapter 13, I read it last time, I believe, I gave it to you. The people who went to spy the line, sorry, the land. They went to spy the land and it was a few of them that went. Two of them had this violent faith. They were aggressive with their faith. When they went, some saw the giants, uh, but, 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 you know, most of them saw giants. And they, they shrank in the face of the giants. Because they were looking at themselves, comparing themselves to these people. Hallelujah. But there are two of them, Caleb and Joshua. 
And that's why we're so proud to give our children those names. Kieran's son's name is Caleb. And we're very proud to give them these names. Caleb, Joshua. He's saying amen because it's Joshua. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're proud when we give these names to our children. They were men of faith. Amen. Not just any, any kind of faith. In the face of adversity, when giants stood right before them, they did not look at the giants and take too much notice on the giant, but they looked within themselves and saw a greater God. Amen. A bigger God. Amen. They look at the, uh, the, the God that they serve, who has sent them and given them that promise. Amen. Rather than looking at what is in front of you. Hallelujah. It's not how tall the mountain is, but it's how big your God is. Amen. So with a violent faith, they were able to shut the mouth of the people and eventually they actually uh, won the land. Amen. They took possession of the land. Moving forward, William Weberforce uh, shook heaven and earth to emancipate slaves in England and eliminate the evil slave trade. And he was angry. Anybody knows who I'm talking about? William Weberforce. Read about him. English man, white man, and his friends, they stood against slavery in England. They fought passionately. They were Christians. They were not just any man. They were, uh, 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 they were not mere men. They were not secular men. They were not people who were, you know, uh, uh, just led by their humanist feelings. They were led by their spiritual identity. Their identity in Christ, their relationship with God taught them that it was wrong. And I'm not saying that other people who were not of uh, the Christian faith did not see it as wrong. But what did they do about it? And did they succeed? God empowered this man. Amen. And the Bible, you know, sorry, <laughs> the Bible. William Wilberforce was angry. And in one of his statements, listen to the statement that he, he made. He said, my blood was at the moment running fire. And I remembered that once in my life, I had felt a terrible might. I knew and rejoiced to know that I was inflicting the sentence of a coward and a liar's hell. This is William Weberforce. A quote from him. His blood was boiling. He was angry. What kind of anger was it? It was a holy anger. An anger that drove him to, to, to go after justice for people who did not look like him, naturally speaking. He went after his own kinsmen, confronted them in every way. He prayed. He went to court. He used his intellectual ability. He fought. Slavery was abolished. If I remember well, he died around the same time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy anger has its root in genuine love. Amen? Both are part of the nature of God. Jesus, love for the man with the withered head, hand aroused his anger against those who would deny him healing. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were there and they wouldn't allow this man to be healed. Because it was the Sabbath day. I think that's in the, in the book of Mark chapter 2. So they won't allow this man. They think that it's wrong. So he asked them a question. What is it that you would do? What would you choose? What is good? To do evil on the Sabbath day or to do good? Because some of you, you do evil on the Sabbath day. He was angry. The Bible says he was angry. And he told the man to get up. Told the man to go. 
You're free. Stretch your arms. And the man stretched forth his arms and his, he was restored. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that that angered the Pharisees? <laughs> Sometimes you're saved, you're, you're working hand in hand with God. God is using you, you know, to bless lives and to transform lives. And people can see it. Instead of rejoicing, they're angry. Only God knows the spirit that is leading you. Instead of supporting it, they will come against it. They will ignore it. But when you do one thing that is bad, they pay attention to it. Yeah. It becomes a, a matter, a topic of discussion for the whole day. You've been doing so many good things all year. They never took even five minutes to talk about it or listen to someone talk about it. And anytime someone starts talking about it, they will divert. By the way, are you coming to my party? God help us. The Pharisees were angry that Jesus healed the sick on the Sabbath day. God have mercy on us. Martin Luther King, this is his quote. Hear it. He never did anything well until his wrath was excited. And then he could do anything well. This is Martin Luther King. There's a bishop called Butler. He, teach, he teaches or taught six conditions that make anger sinful. And I like it. So I wanted to share it with you. The six conditions are as follow. That make anger sinful. Number one, when to favor a resentment or feud, we imagine an injury done to us. Second, when an injury done to us becomes in our minds greater than it really is. I'll read it again. The first one, when to favor a resentment or feud, we imagine an injury done to us. Just to favor that resentment. You go, you zoom in to yourself to draw back that injury that was done to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes things have passed, long past. And to favor just the resentment towards this person or something happens or you favor that, that resentment, you go into yourself and draw that injury, that thing that the person did to you two years ago, three years ago, two weeks ago. Please don't do it. Amen. Because anger will turn into a sin. When an injury done to us becomes, in our minds, greater than it really is. When it's actually, it's greater than it is. Amen. You're making a thing too big. It's bigger than what it's supposed to be. Amen. It was just a joke. When without real injury, we feel resentment on account of pain or inconvenience. I can go on and on about this thing, but I want to run. When indignation rises too high and overwhelms our ability to retrain. When we gratify resentment by causing pain or harm out of revenge. The last one. When we are so perplexed and angry at sin in our own lives that we readily project anger at the sin we find in others. That's powerful, isn't it? I loved it. May God bless Bishop Butler. Amen. So he gave these six things, conditions that make anger sinful. Let's move forward. Last week I told you about the wind. Uh, the, 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 how the wind is so mysterious in that depending on the direction of the wind, you can tell what the mission is. Depending on its direction. So any supernatural, spiritual individual which you should be, don't just stop at just reading the Bible, the letter. Pray. Seek God. Spend time. Your own time. Seeking him. 
Have an intimate relationship. He will open your eyes to the realm of the spirit. Amen. And he will begin to reveal things to you in the scripture that are not revealed to everyone. Then you begin to understand even your own dreams when you dream. Or some of you will start dreaming because some of you don't dream at all. But the Bible says when men go to sleep, not when some, when men go to sleep, God comes and opens their ears and seals instruction, gives them instructions to turn them away from their own pride. Hallelujah. Dreams are for you. Amen. If it wasn't for dreams, J uh, Joseph would have done something very terrible. Some of you relationship, you don't pray. You don't ask God. You don't wait on God. You don't wait so that he can tell you. So he can guide you. So he can instruct you. You don't. You should do that. My wife and I, we prayed. Amen. We got to a, a, a stage where we had to pray. We sought God. We cried. We, we fasted. And God spoke. It was a very critical point. We prayed. We waited on God. And God spoke. Gave us clarity and said, go for it. You've turned around this mountain enough. I had a dream. In a dream, I saw this scripture in the Bible. Specific scripture. I woke up. I opened the scripture. And it says, you've turned around this mountain, mountain long enough. Now, move forward. It's enough. So I said to my wife, this is a dream. After we fasted, we were fasting and praying. Let's move forward. So we moved forward. Because it was critical. What, how do we do when your family, the family of your, you know, the person you want to marry is against you, passionately against you, and they're Christians. And sometimes you're confused. You don't know if it's the will of God or not. You don't know. Sometimes you don't know. What do you do? We have to seek God's face. We have to pray. We have to ask him, are you with us or are you against this? And when God gave the go ahead, we went ahead and we got married. Let the whole world join us. After our marriage, we don't care. As long as God is with us, we are have, we have fine. So our wedding, 14 people were there. 14. In spite of the people that we know. Me, I've known loads of people. I know a lot of people. People will have traveled from Belgium, America, different places to come. But 14 people, I have to be happy with that. So that I can please God. So I can live righteously and not sinfully. Amen. Because when you're young, you burn every day. Hallelujah. So when you seek God's face over that relationship, you seek God's face and God speaks, then do what you should do. Amen. Don't do it because you're burning. Amen. That's very bad. <laughs> Don't get married because you are burning. Hey, is that how you get married? Somebody who marries you because they're burning, you're in trouble. Because they will keep on burning after the marriage. For those who have ear, let them hear. Amen. <laughs> the wind. The direction of the wind will tell you what the wind is about to do, what the wind is doing. When you have a dream and you see the wind, you hear the wind. If you're enlightened, you seek the Lord to know. What it, when you know the direction of the wind, then you know what is happening. Because the direction of the wind determines what the mission is. So the Bible talks about four, four directions that the wind blows from. The south, the east, wind, specifically, it's in your Bible. The south wind, the east wind, the northern, the north wind, and also, what's the last one? The west wind, four specifically. And every single time you hear of the east or the, the south wind. Read your scriptures and you see it. All of them make reference to peace. Gentleness. Quietness. Tranquility. A blessing. The south wind. It makes reference to that. Accurately. It's not like the Quran where sometimes you know you would say the south wind is peaceful and then another time that peace is abrogated. 
and then it's something else. It's now angry. No, in the Bible, it's accurate. The wind, when it blows south, it's peace, it's tranquility. But then the east, when it blows east, it's violent. It's in your scriptures. Hallelujah. <laughs> Eastern wind represents calamity, wrath. Not only the wrath of God, but the wrath, greed, idolatry, and pride of humankind. I've already shared this with you, haven't I? I gave you scriptures on that, didn't I not? Third one, let's read it. Let's, let's go to the third one. I'm taking my time on this one. The third, sorry, was it, will it be the third or the fourth? The fourth, the fourth that I'm giving you today, the fourth characteristic of the wind, which you should also have, is driven, active, or living. Active, driven, or living. Hallelujah. The wind's flexibility comes from the fact that it is always active. Hallelujah. If you're not already active, it will be difficult for you to bend and not break. When you're not already active, when you bend, you easily break. I play tennis. Every time you play tennis, you jump on the, peak, uh, on the court and you play without warming up, you run a risk. It happened to me a few times and it happened to many tennis players. Because your body is cold. So, at that moment, if you were to just go and just play, there is, there's a risk. You may twist your neck. That's why we stretch. Amen? Or well, the sports scientists, they're there. Sports science. They study sports science. Jean-Pierre and uh, David, they're sitting together, plotting to decipher everything I'm saying to see if it's true. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you warm up. So the believer, hear these people of God. The believer must be active spiritually. Always active. Always active. That's a sign that you are alive in Christ. The sign that you are dead naturally is when you don't move. That's a sign that you're dead, naturally speaking. Spiritually, it is a sign that you are dead when there is no spiritual movement. The spiritual individual, the Christian, the believer, not even the spiritual, the Christian must be active. Why? Because any given moment, God can use you. Any given moment, God can take you to a place. Any given moment, you should be ready for God to say, go around the corner. And you meet somebody, say to them, A, Y, Z. You understand what I'm saying, people of God? Like Ananias, the man of God, he was just there. And then Paul <laughs> was stopped by Jesus and converted by Christ himself. And then, and, then, and, and then Paul was sent to Ananias. Because Ananias was ready. Hallelujah. Some of you, you are, you've retired yourself before your retirement. You put yourself in the back seat. You put yourself, you know, on the bench voluntarily. But if you were a footballer, sitting on the bench, you're not happy. But as a Christian on the bench, you're happy. You're fine. It's okay. You just want to be on the bench. Pastor, I haven't asked to do anything in church. I haven't asked to serve or to give me. Why is it that you're... Pastor, I'm okay. On the bench, you're fine. But when you go to work, and you are into pharmacy, for instance. I'm using pharmacy as an example. And they bench you. Meaning they don't ask you to do certain things. You'll be upset. Because you want to learn, don't you? You want to know. But your manager is always benching you. Calling the other person. Come. <laughs> and then they show them different things. And then you're there on the bench. Would you be happy? No. Why is it that you're happy in Christ being on the bench? Jesus spoke about dead men walking. Do you want to be a dead man walking? The believers should be active spiritually. Involved in spiritual activities. Praying all the times. Amen. That's a spiritual activity. Active. 
And if you're not active spiritually, it's easy to fall into sin. It's easy to break. It's easy to fall. It's easy because you're not active. And when I say active, I mean in every way. Let your mind be involved. If you have an, a very smart brain, you have a, an advanced brain, more than your peers, more than many people, use your brain in the things of the kingdom. Use your brain to glorify God. Amen. Search the scriptures with your brain. Remember scriptures. Hallelujah. Memorize scriptures. Work, study, write, make notes, write things that can be used. Amen. Use your brain. As you do that, the brain will be alive for Christ. It's active. It's always ready. Ready to be used. If God was to come here, and I said to someone the other day, when I was in church 15 years ago, growing up, in, I decided that I would not be a bench warmer. That I won't just be here. I decided that I won't be just an average believer. In the world, you don't want to be average. But in Christ, you want to be average. Why? you got to be active. Amen. The Bible said everything that your hand finds doing, do it wholeheartedly. Amen. Don't be idle. Don't stand there doing nothing. Be active. Let your mind always remain, you know, be meditating on a passage in the Bible. Let not a day pass by where a scripture crosses your mind. Because so many things happen during the day. At least a scripture will relate to one of the things that happen. Amen. Let your heart always active in love. Always ready to hug someone, embrace someone, share with someone what you have. Amen. Help someone out of their situation. Be active. Hallelujah. The wind is active. That's why the the wind is flexible. It comes from being active. The wind, you see the wind can be just here like this. In a split second, the wind can switch and start blowing heavily. In a split second, the wind can be going this direction and stop and then go the other direction. The wind can do that. Can you do that? The only way you can do that is if you're active. When you're active, you're keeping yourself warm. Hallelujah. You're keeping yourself warm, ready, warm, ready, waiting. Whatever the Lord says, you do. You're on your way to London. He said, no, go to Wolverhampton. Yes, sir. That's why in the army, they train them so well so that they can obey the order immediately without murmuring. Without, you know what I'm saying, people of God? They, they, they have to be trained to be ready. Amen. When the, the, the bullets are flying up and they say, bend your neck. Your neck is too stiff to bend. Bend it quick. You have a bullet in your head. Your knees is no use. They're not used to going down in prayer. You're not used to bending to pray. And the time has come. You've got to bend. As you try, you just go. Burr. If there's anything like that. This is not a condemnation. This is not something that I'm saying to condemn you. I'm saying it to challenge you and to pull you up. Amen. And that's what the preacher should be doing. Amen. Always encouraging you to keep on keeping on. Amen. 